to be with you again today. This is sort of the first live uh, I interview that I've had with you for, for, oh, I don't know, <laughs> some months now. And the person who's been holding the fort for, for us very nobly has been uh, uh, Bonnie Douglas. Uh, I suddenly heard these footfalls. I thought, well, maybe Bonnie's here. <laughs> but I guess she's not. But she's, she's been holding the fort and uh, making the program work w with me away. I've been in the hospital and ill, and so I have not been able to run the program. But she's stepped in and has wonderfully uh, come up with her own ideas and leadership, and uh, this is my first time here without her. So uh, thank you, Bonnie. We appreciate it. Uh, Ken uh, is Ken Albert is our guest today. And, uh, do you want to? See, I can't see where you, you you're Let right me here. Introduce myself. And yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on on this uh, show, and uh, it's also very good to see you back in your old position here. And thank you. Wish you further success. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ken Ken Albert. Uh, the proprietor, uh, the founder and proprietor of uh, Shelvin Vineyard. And uh, we started the whole venture in 1998, which was the year after I retired from, from IBM. That's when it started all. Uh, we didn't have a lot of uh, capital initially to do this, so we entered in discussions with uh, Shelburne Farms to lease, lease some land. And after Zero amount of time, uh, and they became confident that I could hopefully pull this off and actually plant some grapes and uh, not have it just go to weed. Uh, <laughs> they they signed a, a long-term contract with me for uh, three acres of land, and we still have those three acres. And uh, <coughs> we get into the show. I'll tell you about some of the replanting we've done. We still have some vines on that uh, piece of land that were planted in 1998, but many of the other vines, about one third of it is still the original planting. The other two thirds are new plantings, which I'll get into a little, little bit later. Uh, <coughs> a year after that, we uh, leased some more land from the Meach Cove Trust, which is uh, just two miles down the road, which was also part, of, I guess, years back of the original, excuse me, <coughs> uh, Webb uh, Estate Holdings. It was another member of the Webb family that owned a piece of land. I uh, leased that piece of land from uh, the Meach Cove Trust, which was the successor owner to it. So we then had six acres of, of, of grapes. And uh, I guess it was uh, three years ago, we decided uh, to really jump in with both feet. Uh, we got a bank loan, so we now have, uh, we're privileged to have a debt with uh, the Yankee Farm Credit, which uh, funds a lot of agricultural enterprises. And we built, we, we bought a piece of land, we bought a 13 acre plot of land on Route 7, just south of the Shelburne Museum, just north of the teddy bear. We think it's a good location to be recognized by, by passers by. And built a, uh, a winery building and planted about four acres of, of additional uh, grape plantings. Well, it's quite an extensive uh, operation. It's, it's become that now. And uh, at this point in time, we probably employ, I think, about six people full-time equivalent. We've got uh, myself, my wife Gail working full-time. Uh, we've got one full-time person that's our vineyard and winery foreman, so to speak, and uh, a group of other people that do work in the vineyard and man what we now have is a uh, seven-day-a-week uh, tasting room. So that, that's sort of the, in a snapshot, where we are today. What does Gail do? Gail is the uh, marketing uh, director, and, and she keeps track of the tasting room, managing that, making sure it's properly staffed and the staff is trained. Uh, and she also uh, works at uh, events. We, we've had uh, quite a few small and medium-sized events, up to 100 people present, that uh, things like a bridal shower or a nonprofit fundraising event for some nonprofit organization, uh, business meetings, and the like, which uh, has become quite quite a major uh, time-consuming you know, effort, keeping straight and uh, organized. And Gail's been very, very effective and busy with that. 
That's really neat. It uh, took a lot of courage to uh, uh, go from the IBM world to, to, to of business and, and corporate uh, concerns to uh, being a farmer. That's quite a change. You know, it's, it's a difference. In, uh, to do something like this, you have to have a passion for what you're doing. What was your passion? Well, I, I started growing grapes in, in my backyard when we moved to Shelburne, I guess, over 35 years ago, and uh, sort of developed a passion for growing grapes. That's, that's how it started, uh, more than uh, from, the, from the wine end of it. Did they uh, come up quickly, easily? No, we, we had a, a little clearing in the woods next to our suburban house in, in Shelburne. And uh, it was not really a good place to plant grapes because uh, there was too much shade. There wasn't enough uh, real fresh wind and air coming by to keep all the mildews away. So we never were truly, you know, successful with those grapes. But I just developed a passion and interest in it. Went to the UVM library uh, years and years ago and read just about every book they had on, on grape growing there. This was <laughs> before the internet, so you couldn't do a a, a, search. a Google search for, for information. <coughs> and uh, as I approached uh, retirement from IBM, I was on a project where I, uh, where IBM had to travel across the uh, Vermont-Quebec border, because there's an IBM plant on the other side of the border as well. And uh, on these business trips, I noticed there were uh, commercial vineyards uh, on the Quebec side of the border, and decided you know, if they could do that there, which is probably even a harsher climate to what we have in Vermont. I, I certainly could do it, or I would hope to be able to do it in, in Vermont. So uh, started to uh, write some plans and, uh, <coughs> and proposals for initially a three-acre planting that hopefully after it matured, I'd, I'd then be able to make wine. It takes three years to get the first grapes from a planting. That long? Yeah, it, it's a long-term proposition. So it takes a lot of courage and, and, and trust in the future. Trust, and yes, and, and patience. <laughs> and trust, absolutely. Uh, and not only that, what, 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 what makes it even a bigger challenge is uh, some of the original varieties of grapes we planted on, on, in 1998 on, on the Shelburne Farm site that we leased, uh, where we're still growing grapes, but anyway, they turned out not to be fully hardy in some of the winters. In some years, we'd get a full yield of like four tons per acre for the grapes. And the next year, depending on how harsh the previous winter was, we could get as little as one ton per acre. So for a commercial venture, having, having your product go vary by four times from year to year, it just, it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't the right variety. And uh, which brings me to maybe another little diversion in the, in the story. Uh, we replanted uh, those vines with uh, grapes that were hybridized in Minnesota. And this is another, uh, at least to me, a fascinating story. Uh, probably about 30 years ago, a man named Elmer Swenson, uh, who was a Wisconsin dairy farmer, uh, for some reason got interested in, in, uh, in growing grapes. And he was very, very dissatisfied with the grapes that were growing in Wisconsin. I think he was on the Wisconsin-Minnesota border. <coughs> and uh, he... Uh, started basically hybridizing grapes, taking some of the wild and western grapes, which give you basically sour, sour, you know, not very delectable grapes, and cross them with uh, grapes that came from the eastern U.S. and grapes that came from Europe. All on his own, he did this. Uh, he was not a, a highly schooled person. He probably, you know, I'm not sure if he did or didn't finish high school. He surely didn't finish college, but uh, he had a fascination in this and, and also a an amazing talent. He made thousands and thousands of crosses with some of the native grapes with uh, European grapes as parentage and getting the tasting quality and it turned out the wine quality of the European grape and the hardiness of the, uh, of the American grape that originated, that originates still in, in the Midwest. And uh, he started to gather a following. This, uh, he initially didn't uh, have any interest in making wine from the grapes. He just wanted good eating grapes, but I guess uh, many people in the Midwest were interested in making wine from grapes, which they couldn't do because uh, the grapes that they had planted the, of European origin and of Eastern North American origin just were not hardy enough for the cold weather of the Midwest. And uh, uh, he 
gathered a large following of uh, would-be grape growers in, in Minnesota. And uh, eventually, the, uh, the University of Minnesota caught wind of this, and he actually was invited to be a technician at the university's experimental lab for a number of years. Oh, all right. So he was uh, on the payroll. Well, I don't think he probably didn't make very much money from, from <laughs> grapes. And, uh, he, I think he's become Im immortalized for what he's done, but it, it wasn't because of the money he made from the grapes. And uh, I think there was a small stipend that he did receive. And uh, interestingly enough, a couple of years ago, uh, one of his uh, neighbors stopped by our vineyard. And uh, she didn't know that what his achievements were. And uh, as we described the, the wine and the grapes to her, she said, Elmer Swenson. He was my neighbor. He was a terrible dairy farmer. All he wanted to do was grow grapes. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so we thought it was an interesting story. Anyway, he, the University of Minnesota didn't fully take him seriously because, after all, he didn't have any uh, advanced Rentals. degrees, much less basic degrees. <laughs> but uh, his grapes uh, were started to be grown by you know hundreds of acres worth in, in uh, Minnesota, in particular and uh, making very nice wine. And uh, I guess shortly before his death, the University of Minnesota finally took over the program. They hired professional uh, enologists and, uh, and, and uh, grape growers to uh, really understand you know, what the, the science of the, the optimum cross would be. And uh, so today, I've got grapes that are the original Elmer Swenson development and also some grapes that was developed by the uh, University of Minnesota, which is sort of the second generation of his, uh, of, of his work. So he's sort of the Johnny Appleseed, I guess you can call him, of uh, American grape growing. And, uh, he died, I guess, in well into his 90s uh, <coughs> a couple years ago. The program is, is really continuing at full speed. <coughs> Uh, at the University of Minnesota, and we're currently growing two varieties of grapes that uh, the university developed that we think are really going to make successful uh, wines here in Vermont. One is called La Crescent. It's a white grape, and it's, it, it exudes an apricot nose to it, and uh, it's good to 35 degrees below zero. Wow. Now, we haven't hit that here. The, whole, the coldest we get around our, our vineyard, which is our close to Lake Champlain, is about minus 20. But that's enough to eliminate a lot of the grapes that originate here in eastern North America and, and really makes it those, those Midwestern, uh, grapes of Midwestern parentage uh, just ideal for here. And uh, it's made, I think, growing grapes in Vermont economically feasible because we, no matter what the previous winter was, we, we think we can get a full yield of about four tons of grapes <coughs> per acre of planting which is what you need to, to have a commercially uh, feasible uh, planting. What, w the reason the, the winter is so important, the little dormant buds that, that form uh, on the vine uh, in, in, the, in the fall go dormant in the winter, those buds actually must remain alive and actually the center of the bud is not even frozen during the winter. If you would take a razor blade, take the little small little pip, little buds at each node and slice through the uh, the node, you'd actually see in the middle of the winter, it's almost like a miracle, a bright green, unfrozen center. And the reason it's unfrozen, it's surrounded by all the carbohydrates that form in the fall. And so that must remain viable through the winter because that contains next year's fruit. And, uh, and if that's harmed by the winter, you lose the fruit. The vine will sprout from the bottom and the, the vine won't die, but you won't get fruit the next year. So these Minnesota vines have the property and the capability of, of doing that. I don't know if uh, you can probably see the same kind of buds on, on all kinds of trees and, and shrubs throughout Vermont. And obviously, the, the buds on a maple tree are good for 30, 35 below zero. But even with those buds, I'm sure if you take a little razor and, and, and dissect the center of the bud, you'll see, even if it's below zero outside, you'll see an unfrozen center that probably has a bright green color. What enables them to be unfrozen? The surrounded by carbohydrates, very dense carbohydrates. And uh, I'm not a botanist, so I can't give you any more learned explanation than that. But uh, it, it, they can't freeze. If they freeze, they, 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 they're, they're gone, which is an interesting uh, situation. 
So that's the kind of vines we're planting. And La Crescent is, is, is a white grape. And uh, it has this wonderful apricot nose to it and makes a, a very uh, aromatic white wine, which uh, we think is, is somewhat unique. And uh, if there is a, what, what I keep on thinking, if there is a, a wine product that Vermont might export, you know, beyond our borders to, you know, to the rest of the world, it might be uh, some of the Crescent wines, because it's absolutely unique uh, with this wonderful fruity apricot nose and taste to it. Uh, and usually it's a little bit sweet. Uh, you can't make it dry because uh, it's a grape that ripens with a lot of acidity. And uh, the whole secret, I think, to making a nice wine is to balance the natural acidity in the grape with the, uh, with the sugar in the grape. And if there's a lot of acidity in the grape, you've got to make sure the wine has a little bit of sweetness to sort of soften the acidity. Uh, the other grape that we are, are planting is uh, Marquette which is a red grape, also developed by the University of Minnesota. And all these Minnesota names are uh, French sounding, but it must be, uh, they're, they're Minnesota locations. La Crescent grape, I think, is named after a small town in Minnesota. Marquette, I believe, is, is for a geographic region in, uh, I believe, a river valley in, in Minnesota. A lot of people think they may be uh, of Canadian origin. They're not. Uh, they're, they're of uh, Minnesota origin, I guess, from the original French settlers that, that, that came down in the Minnesota region. But the Marquette grape is a, a red grape, and uh, it's a red grape that gives you European quality uh, red wine taste. That's intriguing. With the whole field in itself. Yeah, the, the, what the university achieved with the, the Marquette, that, that was their second or third, I, I think, cross, you know, the, the post Elmer Swenson. Uh, era of, of grape development. <coughs> they achieved a, a most, most hybrid grapes, which are basically a cross between European parentage and some Native American parentage. If they're red grapes, they don't have the traditional tannin qualities that you get from a, a Pinot Noir or a Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, somehow the crosses that people have made have never achieved that until the university and, and, and some others recently have achieved uh, different grape varietals uh, that have the tannin qualities and give you a European tasting red. And uh, we're hoping that uh, we can uh, put these on the shelves side by side with the traditional grapes like, uh, grape wines like Pinot Noir and actually, uh, actually, uh, I think have people as pleased with these as any other wine. And we recently had our first, w w last October, October 08, we had our first harvest from the Marquette grapes. Grapes we planted in 2006, reached their third season. We harvested a small amount. We only get a small amount the first harvest. We made about, oh, just under 100 uh, gallons of, of wine and bottled it and entered it into a contest in the Big E Eastern uh, Wine Competition. And uh, for the Marquette, we won a gold medal. So we were very pleased with that. Hmm. Um, you want to address a few remarks about the history of wine, why wine is sort of synonymous with Western civilization? I don't know if I could, but let me try. <laughs> I guess if you go back, uh, obviously wine was uh, a, a mentioned and basically, basically an important uh, Importantly, in many, many parts of both the Old Testament, I guess, the, yes. uh, the New Testament. In fact, it's interesting. Uh, there is a <coughs> portion of the Old Testament where it says uh, you should not harvest uh, grapes from uh, a, a vine until the third season. And, uh, and it, it's interesting if you go to the uh, horticultural books uh, in the instructions on how to you know, basically develop a, a vineyard is uh, don't harvest your, your, your grapes till the third season. What you should do in the second season, any grapes that form, you should snip them off. Really? To force the, uh, the, uh, the vine itself to, I guess, send out stronger roots because that when you finally get the first, the first harvest in the third year, it's a pretty robust harvest and, and the vine is strong enough to sustain it. So maybe the, the Bible also has some... Uh, Instructions for, for gardeners there that we didn't realize. 
And why is it, you know, why, why, is, why are grapes used uh, versus so many other kinds of fruit? <coughs> uh, basically, you could make a wine from any, any, I guess, vegetable or fruit that has sugar in it. But grapes just have the right balance of things. Uh, grapes ripen with the sugar at about 20 to 25 percent by weight. So about a quarter of the weight of a, a ripe grape is, is pure sugar. And, uh, and just the right balance of acid. So if you just squeeze some grapes and put a glass of grape juice on a table and, and let it sit for a couple of weeks, there's some probability that you'd have a drinkable wine just by ignoring it and letting it sit there. Uh, because that's just, there's no other addition that you really have to do. What we do in modern winemaking, instead of relying on whatever the wild yeasts are, which may give you a good wine or it might give you a, uh, a vinegar-like wine, we use uh, yeast that was uh, basically the yeast used in some of the European vineyards and reproduced in, in uh, laboratories. And we sprinkle that yeast into the, uh, into the grape juice and, and it gives you a pretty good guarantee of having a, a stable wine. Mm. Intriguing. And uh, in winemaking, you know, if the grape ripens with a lot of acid, you've got to you've got to taste it very carefully as the, as the fermentation pro progresses and decide. Do you want to let the yeast convert all the sugar into alcohol and therefore may have no sugar left or no sweetness left in the wine? If you do that and the grape is too acidic, it's good. You, you, you'll have uh, you'll have an unpleasant tasting, sort of bitter tasting, sour tasting wine. So uh, if it has a lot of acidity, you'll stop the fermentation with maybe only one or two percent of the sugar still remaining, but that's going to soften the whole effect. <coughs> Intriguing. So it, uh, what also gets my curiosity up is Wine was always used uh, to sort of to seal a, a, a pact, to seal an agreement or, or a contract, or or, or a, uh, for ancient times, it was uh, it was a way to uh, make it legitimate that what, what was agreed upon. So is this uh, this is this from biblical times? Huh? Yeah, uh, yeah. Medieval times as well. Or? I think so. Interesting. We don't do that today, do we? We don't seal packs with, with uh, wine that much, I guess. <laughs> we do it with lawyers. With today. lawyers, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, and large documents and a lot of words. We've also had our share of lawyers working in a, in a vineyard. Uh, there's a lot of regulations that you've got to uh, adhere to. Really? You're, you're, you're stuck with that? Yeah, well, I guess uh, it, it's sort of a legacy of... Uh, the uh, Prohibition era. Mm -hmm. the, the the wine wine is one of the few few commercial items in the United States that isn't governed by the normal commerce <coughs> regulations <coughs> that the Constitution calls out. If you produce a product, a, a non-alcoholic product, in one state, uh, the, the no other state can can create regulations that are permitted from being sold there. Uh, but with wine. Uh, when prohibition was repealed in the 30s, uh, the stipulation was there must have been, I haven't done a lot of reading about it, but there must have been compromises between uh, states that were happy or states that weren't happy with prohibition being repealed. But it gave each individual state the commercial control of how wine would be sold, distributed, and indeed how it would be consumed. And so, uh, we can uh, we can sell wine in Vermont, and if we want to, you know, open a mail order business, which we, we haven't done, to sell wine to other states, we'd have to basically buy a license for each one of those individual states. And uh, some of those licenses are, are nominal fees, and some of them are several hundred dollars. Well, wow. uh, not only that, uh, if you get a license for an individual state. Uh, most states have a rule that either monthly or quarterly, whether you sell wine to that state or not, you've got to report you know, activity or lack of activity to the state. So basically they're putting a lot of paperwork hurdles in your way. 
uh, I guess it was three years ago, 2005, was it? The Supreme Court passed a ruling that affected the whole behavior uh, with wine and <coughs> other alcoholic products among the states. In uh, they, I guess there were there were some lawsuits that that they, out of state people were being treated unfairly. It wasn't in Vermont. I think the, the lawsuits were in New York and Michigan, if I recall. And uh, the Supreme Court came down with a rule that each state can come up with its own wine uh, rules, but if, mm -hmm. if they do have a rule, they couldn't treat out-of-state wineries any different than in-state wineries. So it did open up a little bit of a window uh, for uh, out-of-state wineries to ship to, to the various states. But it's still a very little window because there's a lot of paperwork. And the only wineries that really have been able to take advantage of that are the very large ones that have large staffs to take care of the paperwork because, after all, the other 49 states they've got to deal with. So we're still, you know, realistically shipping our wines <coughs> solely within Vermont. Mm -hmm. Do you have to preserve them? Wine? Mm. Hopefully, we're, you know, we try to have our wine sold within the year after harvest. And, and so far, we've been able to, we're very lucky, they will sell out everything we have. Mm. But wines, by their nature, you know, do, do have a pretty good uh, staying power, uh, particularly uh, some of the reds. Uh, we've got some of our reds that are a few years old, and they're still good. We've also noticed that some of the whites from some of the, these, these hybrid grapevines uh, are best drunk when they're young. Not all wine actually does improve with age. Uh, some of the very fruity tasting white wines, uh, some of them we make and some others make, are best drunk young. If you, if you leave them three, four years, you might find that they're still drinkable, but it's lost the fruity charm that, that it originally had. So have you actually sealed a deal with, uh, with, with wine ever in your effort on this thing? I, I, I say I haven't. I've only done it with, uh, with paper and lawyers. Uh, we're this year had probably one of the most challenging years we've had <coughs> in that this season we really haven't had a real summer. I don't know if you've noticed that. Yeah, I, I have, certainly. No real summer. No real summer this year. And uh, as soon as you get a sunny day, the, the, the evening seems to turn to rain, so. <laughs> You've noticed. Uh, we've noticed. And uh, the grapes basically almost like a semi-arid situation, which is, I guess, why places like Napa Valley are so well suited. And uh, even if you go to southern France, it's a relatively dry kind of climate. Uh, the grapes we grow here are, you know, based, you know, as, since they're hybrids between native grapes and, and European grapes, they are suited to this kind of climate. But to keep them mildew-free and, and rot-free during these uh, very rainy seasons, we have to do a lot of spraying. Oh, does that make a problem for, for the uh, plant? Well, it makes a problem for the for the people doing the work, but uh, as well as the plant. <coughs> you. Uh, you have to worry about being hurt from the the, uh, the anti bug killers. And the yeah, well, actually, it's more for the mildews than the bugs that we're spraying for. Mm -hmm. Although this year, for the first time, we've also sprayed for bugs. Uh, when I started out, I my goal was to try to to do it uh, organically, and we have achieved organic certification. On uh, I achieved it on on the first two plantings. Mm, all right, and. Uh, that's the good news is the bad news I had to forego some of that certification in, in recent years. When we first planted, there were, wasn't a lot of grapes planted in, in, in our region. And it took maybe close to a decade for all the different grape diseases to find their way <laughs> into the wine or into the vineyards. And I can proudly say I think that every grape disease that, that does exist in Eastern North America, <coughs> we discovered them in our vineyard. So. Uh, we're at the point where, for some of the varieties, that we, we're planting some pure European variety, uh, 
varieties. Actually, the one we're planting is, is Riesling. And uh, for about five or six years, I was able to grow it organically. But eventually, a disease called black rot, which puts little black spots on the grapes uh, in, in the wet seasons, and, and eventually destroys the grapes, seem to have found the, uh, the Riesling. And, and the Riesling is very, very uh, susceptible to this disease. So I had to give up organic certification, and we do do two or three sprayings of uh, regular uh, chemicals to, to combat the, uh, the black rot. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't given up <coughs> growing, growing uh, organically on our site on Shelburne Farms. That's still certified organic. Uh, but even where we're not doing it organically, we're still not using any herbicides or any other uh, chemicals, we're trying to use as many of the organic chemicals, and the only exception has been for the mildews and, 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 and the black rot. I remember my father, who <coughs> he used to uh, grow a lot of, of uh, native plants and uh, all kinds of uh, bushes and small trees, and, and uh, he was always spraying, he was always spraying with his, with his pump. Uh -huh. on his back, spraying the, the, uh, the uh, plants to keep them free. Now we've, we've avoided, I think, excessive spraying. I think one of the, one of the keys to avoiding it is picking a, a location that, number one, has a lot of natural wind coming along. Mm -hmm. So when you do get those moisture periods, the wet periods, uh, the wind hopefully comes along and quickly dries out the, the leaves of the vine. There's a certain incubation period for these uh, mildews to form. <coughs> and if the wind comes along soon enough after a rain, uh, the moisture may not be long enough for the disease to set in. Now, eventually it does happen here, but it happens less often, I believe, on our sites because of the wind. So while we're spraying, we're not, we're not doing a heck of a, you know, uh, a lot of spraying, trying to, do, you know, trying to spread it out in the intervals between spraying. Uh, the other, the other uh, thing, of course, is we want to pick varieties that are, are less susceptible to the, the mildews and, and the black rot. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the exception of the Riesling, we, we've picked the varieties we have picked, these hybrid grapes, uh, are, are relatively resistant, although this season, even the, some of the most resistant varieties, with all the rain we've had, the most resistant varieties, have, uh, have shown uh, some susceptibility to the black rot. On the organic uh, sites, that there's no organic certified material I can spray that really controls the black rot. So we just have to trust that the grapes, just by their inherent uh, DNA, will resist, uh, you know, be completely, you know, overwhelmed by the black rot. Now, <coughs> you obviously have a great deal of interest in, in grapes, now you're, and you have some some offspring. Do your children have an interest in, in, in growing grapes or, or, or in veg vegetables and farming uh, uh, as a result of your example? Good question. Uh, unfortunately, I started the whole venture, the grape venture, quite late in my life. I just retired after 30 years at IBM. Both my uh, daughters had moved away. One lives in uh, New York City, the other one in Washington, D.C. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, it's, it's probably too late for me to get them, you know, brainwashed into doing something like this. <laughs> they, they're off on their, their own uh, interests. Uh, although both of them are, you know, are very supportive. Uh, uh, my, my older daughter is here with her two grandchildren this week, and uh, they've been helping out in the vineyard. In fact, the two grandchildren just love to go to the winery, help out uh, in the sales room, and uh, also help out with... Uh, weeding and, 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 and tasks like that. So maybe I can interest my, maybe it's not too late to interest my grandchildren since I, I missed the opportunity with my, my own children who are now adults. Uh. Hmm. I would think it's quite a task to get your own family inter interested in, in uh, growing uh, grapes or, or any, any veg vegetation. It's interesting, there, there are there are uh, a lot of people here in Vermont with uh, interest. I've been approached by a lot of young people. One of the things, when, when I started the venture, the one concern, I guess the, the biggest concern I had is would I find people in Vermont 
that would be interested and willing to do farm work like this. Mm -hmm. It's hard work, some a bit repetitive. Sometimes, uh, at least in many of the seasons up to this one, in, in very, very hot summer weather. Uh, and also, when you're doing the pruning in early spring, in very inclement, nasty weather. Can I get people to actually do this kind of work in Vermont uh, for you know some sort of reasonable pay? And I've never had to put an ad in for uh, for for help. Really? I've never uh, had to put any kind of uh, distress call out for people to help. The, the people approach us, and uh, uh, many many people are, are students and former students in uh, some of the UVM. Uh, environmental and, and agricultural programs. They, they attract some wonderful young people to those programs. and They've probably been the, uh, the lifeblood of our uh, operation. We've managed to keep uh, some, of, I've got some, some people that work in, for me part-time. Started, uh, I guess, the second or third year of, of, of our venture. So they've been with us nearly uh, 10 years. That's quite a length of time. Yeah. Well, you hear about Oh, migrant workers coming from the uh, Caribbean to help mm -hmm. in the uh, apple orchards and uh, other kinds of fruit growing places in Vermont. And they're regulars, they're, they're, they're sort of part of the, uh, of the uh, environment and uh, seem to be dedicated to it. Uh, so I wonder whether we had that kind of a commitment ourselves. It looks like you know there are there is a certain number of people that do have I have that interest. I've got, as I say, some former students, some current students working for me. I've got some people in their middle years, housewives, uh, uh, retired retired uh, people. Mm. I've got uh, very lucky to have one person that did uh, a couple of people that have done farming in their background. Uh, people that have been uh, mail deliverers working for me, people uh, with all kinds of uh, varied skills that never included uh, grape growing that, that have become uh, just very valuable contributions to our whole effort. And, uh, it, does, it does require, it does require, it's a labor intensive kind of uh, venture. Uh, as far as growing grapes, in, in the spring we do the pruning, which is cutting away the growth from last year. And uh, what's key to, to growing a, a grapevine and keeping the, uh, the clusters uh, disease-free is uh, training the, uh, the, the vine such that each individual cluster has its own sort of place in the sun and the wind. So it doesn't you know, have the moisture sticking around on it too long. So there's a lot of pruning we have to do in the spring. Uh, we've got to do it again in the late spring after everything sprouts if, to get the, the vine, the shoots position going in the right directions. And then uh, two or three times in, in, in midsummer, we, we have to again come along and uh, <coughs> open up the, uh, the canopy, as you call it, to ensure that the, uh, the grapes uh, are, are still seeing the sun and the wind. Mm. Otherwise, they're not going to ripen, or they'll rot off the vine before it gets a chance to ripen. So we're, in fact, we've got folks out there today, uh, what we call leaf pulling. And it, it's exactly what, what, what it states. It's uh, pulling the leaves away and just snapping them off that are blocking the, uh, uh, the grape clusters, such that when you approach the vine, you can see each one of the clusters sort of free of the leaves. <coughs> a grapevine tends to grow sort of in a jungle-like way, covering all the, the clusters of grapes. And if it does that, those grapes are going to rot. You probably see that in the wild grapes that are growing uh, on the, on the trees and the roadsides in Vermont. It's very rare that even some of the wild grapes, uh, even though they're native to here, actually ripen without first rotting. Hmm. And so the key is you've got to, you've got to get air circulation. And, uh, there are books and volumes written about uh, grape pruning and what they call canopy management. And, uh, it, it's a whole science, uh, probably perfected by these uh, New Zealand uh, grape growers that have spread out now around the world. Uh, they call them the flying winemakers, uh, uh, bringing uh, the canopy management technology to, to the far corners of the world. From New Zealand? From New Zealand. You see them in uh, California. You see them in Chile. You see them in, uh, in France. Uh, and 
uh, New Zealand and, our, and Australia seem to be the sort of the, the, the energy to, to spread this around the world. Uh, although uh, years back, uh, the people at Cornell University were writing volumes and volumes on how to manage the canopy of a, mm. of a vine. Uh, but so no, never to the uh, effect that the uh, New Zealand and, and Australian people have done. Yeah, the, there's a, I guess there's old world wine and new, new world wine. Old world wine obviously is the, the, the European uh, growing of grapes and new world wine includes every place outside of Europe. And so sort of the new world winemakers have sort of uh, revolutionized uh, wine growing. In fact, uh, I guess the two largest grape producing and grape consuming uh, countries are Spain and Italy. And uh, only recently have uh, you know the sort of the, the quality of winemaking in, in those two countries caught up to what what you know some of the new world winemakers uh, have done. Uh, and, and now you you can end up really almost in any wine producing country in the world and find really high quality wines that are made to pretty you know you know with globalization. The positive, one of the positive parts of globalization is, is the knowledge that's spread around on how to best manage the grapevines, and then once you've got the grape juice, how to best manage uh, converting that grape juice into in, in, into a you know nice palatable wine. Now, if someone watching this program right now is interested in working for you, might you get a phone call? Yeah, they can. They can call us up. Us up, or they can uh, go on to our website, shelvingvineyard.com, and uh, get our email off that and uh, email us and let us know their interest. At this point in time, we, we're, we're in pretty good shape for day to day workers. We will be interested, anyone interested in helping with the harvest, which uh, starts the last week of September into the first two to three weeks of October. Hmm. So that's when we'll meet some people. It's sort of a, one of the peak uh, periods. It's one of the many peak periods of when we need we need help. But right now we're blessed with, as far as the day-to-day -day operation, with uh, a very wonderful crew of people, both in the in the winery and in the vineyard. That's great, very great. Anyone from IBM who's joined you, who used to be a comrade? I'm sorry. Anyone from IBM who used to work with you? Who, who, who is now a comrade in the vineyard? Oh, that's a good question. No one specifically. I've met, I haven't met, not, no one here from IBM in, in Vermont that I know of is specifically growing grapes here, besides, or crazy enough to do it, besides me. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've attended a lot of conferences where grape growers get together and winemakers get together, and, and have, have met quite a few. IBM people from other IBM locations that have become uh, grape growers and winemakers. I know there's a, a wonderful winery at the northern tip of, uh, of Long Island, uh, what they call the North Fork of Long Island, called Pominock Winery. That, uh, he's a former IBM person like mm -hmm. me. Uh, there's, a, I believe, a winery in, in the Finger Lakes, uh, also uh, a former IBM employee, and I believe there are a few people on the West Coast too. So there are there are a certain number of people that that, that followed, a, I guess, or pioneered a similar similar path. That's great. But, uh, really. There's quite a few other IBM retirees that have done, I guess, other interesting ventures uh, around here. So not, not not in grapes. The uh, uh, Cornell University. Uh, it was interesting to me. I did some graduate work there. And they they had a, a program in uh, uh, what birds sound like uh, in, in the wild. And uh, you can buy a book, you press a button, and uh, you want to hear what a Phoebe sounds like. Uh, they'll have a Phoebe's voice hmm. uh, in the book, or a, or a uh, red-tailed hawk, or, or a... Uh, uh, well, I mean, you pick it, it's, you name it, it's, it's there. And it's intriguing, and they're accurate and scientifically well put together. 
So if you haven't seen that, any of you, I encourage you to see what Cornell has done. Interesting, interesting. Well, Cornell has been a very important factor in, in the knowledge base for for a, a lot of things around here, including including winemaking. Hmm. I guess Cornell, you know, for east of the Rockies, is probably the pioneering institution for uh, uh, you know the, the science and the art of, of, of uh, growing grapes and, and making wine. Really, why is that? Uh, well, the Finger Lakes of New York State, I guess, uh, they're ideal for that. Is, is of course the, the major uh, wine district, you know, east of the Rockies, the lar still the largest one, uh, and actually it, it it is quite a vigorous community of winemakers there and uh, probably growing in reputation. So when I started, uh, you know, I decided to, to go into this, this kind of venture, I, I started to go to conferences that Cornell holds in the, in the, uh, in the Finger Lakes. Mm -hmm. And that's where I got to know some of these, these other people. And uh, it's, it's been very important. It's interesting, Cornell also developed some of the hybrid grapes that we first planted. And it turned out those grapes were hardy enough for the Finger Lakes of New York State, but not hardy enough for every winter here that we have in the Champlain Valley. So those are some of the grapevines that we actually planted in 1998, and some of them uh, pulled up in, in, uh, in, in 2008 and 2009 and replaced them with the Minnesota hybrids. Hmm. So Minnesota, the University of Minnesota, doesn't have a, uh, it has an experimental program, it doesn't have an educational program there, you know, it doesn't have formal classes. But it looks like the Minnesota hybrid, hybrid effort has sort of uh, taken over from the earlier effort that Cornell had in hybridizing grapes. And I think Cornell is de-emphasizing that to some extent because most of the regions of New York State, people have discovered you can grow the pure European varieties and don't need the hybrids because they're just, the Finger Lakes of New York State are probably, on average, five degrees less cold in the winter than we are, and that's all it takes. That's, we're just on the margin of being able to grow some of those pure European vines. That's why we still can grow some, some Riesling, but uh, it really makes more sense for us to grow the hybrids. And with Minnesota developing hybrids that we think have uh, the wine quality of the, of the original European grapes, we, we feel pretty confident that there's a good future for growing grapes in Vermont, not just at Children Vineyard, but a lot of other places. In wonderful, Vermont. wonderful. Sorry? I, I, that's wonderful to hear that. Yeah, we're hoping that there'll be uh, sort of a meaningful wine trail, just like there is a cheese trail in Vermont. Yeah. Uh, and, and there also is, I guess, a beer trail at this point. For, you know, Vermont uh, microbreweries have uh, established a sort of a national reputation now. Uh, Vermont Cheeses, I think, have developed a, a, a world-class reputation, and uh, th our goal is to to get uh, increase the, the the knowledge and the awareness of Vermont wines. Uh, two years ago, uh, with help from the state uh, and, and all the other winemakers in Vermont, uh, the Vermont Wine and Grape Council was formed, and we meet. Uh, once every month and once every other month in Montpelier. And uh, all the winemakers uh, basically now have a, a focal central point that will help in development of a, of a wine trail, help with our knowledge of, of how to grow and, and who's growing what and, and, and where we can hopefully develop a grape farmers that, that might be able to sell grapes to some of the people that are making wine and need more grapes. If anyone is interested in the, I think you can go on the web and uh, I'm trying to think of the name. It's pr probably just Google Vermont Wine and Grape Council and come up with the website. And uh, a map will come up in, in that website that will lead you to every one of the, uh, the winemakers in Vermont. When I first started to make wine in Vermont, I was the third grape growing winery in the state. Uh, the two that are earlier than me started a year before. So basically, the whole history of Vermont winemaking originates, grape winemaking originates sort of from 1997 onwards. And now, I think there are 14 wineries that have uh, federal and state bonded license to make wine. 
So it, it's become a, a measurable factor here in Vermont. Uh, and uh, our, our goal now is to improve our techniques collectively. And uh, I think our wine is getting better and better. And maybe one of these days we will be exporting wine to other states. Oh, right. Like, like you know, we're exporting cheese and, and, and beer. Uh, right now, uh, wine is made in Vermont. It's sold, probably 99% of it's sold in the state of Vermont. We're selling our wine uh, statewide. We, uh, we're distributed by one of the wholesale distributors. The name of the distributor is Vermont Wine Merchants. Uh, they're located here in Burlington, but they distribute from Brattleboro to Bennington all the way to the northern corners of the state, and they distribute our wine to all those corners of the state. So we feel very lucky that we have that kind of uh, sort of teamwork and help in, in for spreading our wine. So you can our wines are sold not in the chain supermarkets, but virtually every uh, uh, you know, co-op, grocery store, every uh, you know, specialty food store and, and, and wine shop in Vermont should or hopefully should have, have one of, at least one of our wine varieties on, on the shelf. I like your sense of pride in that. I really do. Because uh, the, the, the farmer, the agricultural person, should have pride in what they have accomplished, particularly when they started from nowhere. Well, I feel very lucky to have been able to, you know, start this venture. You know, sort of relatively late in my, in my, in my life, and uh, be able to do it, uh, help to do it, and, uh, and and I think the most important thing is probably the passion to, to do something like that, and the support of my family to, to be able to do it. They help you out when you're stuck sometimes. I oh, yeah. yeah. As I say, my wife is also now helping out full-time. She never realized how much work it would be to be a full-time <laughs> marketing director of a, of a fledgling enterprise, which is what we are. And uh, I mean, what we're doing is uh, learning every day. Uh, we, we built the, the winery that we have, uh, started it, what, two and a half years ago. It opened in February of 2008. And we went from that point in time being only wholesale distributors of wine to now we're doing the retail from the, from the winery, which is a whole new experience for us, a whole new learning experience. Uh, and also now with that w wonderful winery building that we have, uh, holding, how, holding events. How big a building is it? Well, it's about 110 feet long by about 40 feet wide. So it's, a, it's sort of like a... I guess Vermont barn-sized mm -hmm. building, uh, built in a traditional style. Neat. Uh, we we uh, we had a wonderful architect uh, do it, Steve Salin, happens to be a local uh, firm in Shelburne, and uh, I know people that come into the winery are, are praising the, the appearance of the building. And it, it turns out it's it's a it's a wonderful spot to hold a, a you know, small or medium-sized celebration. So that's the, that's the story of, of that building. And uh, what we're doing now is we're working with the, the grapevines that surround it. And uh, every year now, it's gonna, it's the, the winery is going to be more and more appearing to be surrounded by all these vines uh, to really give it an uh, appearance of, of being a, uh, an enterprise that we don't just make the wines, but we, we, we grow the grapes. And, mm -hmm. and people can come and, uh, and see the grapes growing right next to the, the vineyard. How grand. And, uh, this is the time of the year now. It's very interesting to look at the, the grapes. If it's a red grape, uh, this is the time of the year. It almost suddenly turns red. Hmm. Uh, grapes, through most of the growing season, even if they are red, are green. And when it gets into mid-August, uh, they go through a biological process that all of a sudden they, uh, they go from being solid, looking like little green peas, like light green peas, looking like uh, grapes. Uh, if it's a red grape, they'll, they'll start turning red. And if it's a, <coughs> a green or a white grape, uh, it'll, it'll start becoming a little bit more yellow-like and a little softer in the touch. And suddenly it becomes somewhat edible at that point. It still needs more ripening because we won't, we won't pick for another couple of months. But uh, that, that period is called beration, which I guess is a French term that has become American term as well. The Parisian is the process where the grape suddenly becomes ripe. How many? Three minutes to go, they're telling us. Well, okay. It's been an interesting experience. And 
Well, sitting before the cameras here. I'm delighted to trying to figure out. I have to try to understand where I should look. Still haven't figured it out. <laughs> well, I guess when the red light is on, that means the camera is on, right? Usually. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Ken. Appreciate it very much. And you can you can buy this videotape, of course, if you wish. Oh, yeah. Uh, your own picture, uh, or or you can use it as a uh, PR piece. Oh. Okay. It's your property. So just get in touch with the Vermont uh, Community Access, and they'll do whatever they have to do. So I appreciate your being here. Well, I, again, I thank you for inviting me. And again, it's wonderful to see you back in the seat <laughs> here. It's good to be back. It really is. It's been a long effort, struggle. Uh, yeah. I, I was ill with, I guess you might say, uh, with a, uh, a form of uh, Oh, what's the name of it? Anyway, I'd rather forget it. <laughs> I imagine so. But so thank you for coming. Well, it's been my, my pleasure. And having trust in our organization. Okay. Uh, I wish you well in your, all of your efforts. Well, thank you. I wish you well. Thank you. In your recovery. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, what happens now? Some music comes in or something? They start to play some music. Is, is this music of your choice? Are you My choice. So what music is that? It's a... Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a... Uh, see, I'm, I'm, I'm out of... Uh, you can't put your finger on that one. No, but it's a public... Well, Sounds like it's from a movie or something. It's um...